All right. Okay. Hi. This week we're going to be doing uh, the sixth Go Show in Volume Five. It's called the Pure and Far Reaching Voice. Uh, the Pure and Far Reaching Voice starts on page. Uh, pardon me. Uh, Three twenty-eight, and I will end up going to the. Um, uh, background before, but before I get started, because this Go Show is going to mention Shakyamuni a few times, I don't want anybody to get confused. I mean, I know everybody around the table. I've gone over this so many times. Everybody's pretty clear. But I just ended up having somebody that I know. It's like a 50-year practitioner that doesn't understand this issue of Shakyamuni versus Nietzsche and as it relates to the Buddhism of sowing, Buddhism of harvest, Buddhism. Wow. Okay, so, yeah. Wow. So, after almost 50 years, they, they went from being an uneducated Nietzsche and Shoshu believer to a completely full of shit, slanderous Nietzsche and Shoe believer, and they didn't even mean to. They didn't even make an official conversion. They just accepted some of the tenets of Nietzsche and Shoe that are in such conflict that they are slander, mm -hmm. okay? And so I don't want to take this whole hour or so getting, I'm going to get this Go Show completely out. So here we go. I'm just going to read you. Go uh, dictionary definitions. Then I'm going to read you something from the OTT to remind us who we are mm -hmm. as bodhisattvas of the earth. And then I'll read the Go Show as we see him encourage Shijo Kingo back when he was back on Sado Island before he really announced the truth of the Buddhism of sewing. Mm -hmm. He's already written the, the uh, uh, opening the eyes, but he hasn't written the object of devotion for observing the mind or any of the other formulative go shows that you know I'll, I'll bring that all that out so starting okay so teacher of true cause who knows what teacher of true cause is what's the true cause why do we, why are we called do you remember when we used to when we first started practicing everybody talked about true buddha true buddha true buddha right mm -hmm. we're all true buddhists right mm -hmm. what makes us true buddhists nam myoho renge kyo so the teacher of true cause would be the obviously the the, the teacher that taught Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the teacher of true cause from the Go Show or from the dictionary on page 662, mm -hmm. 661. In Nichiren's teachings, and again, we're talking about Nichiren Buddhism right. now, right? Okay, so in Nichiren's teachings, the Buddha who expounds the fundamental law right. or the true cause that enables all people to attain Buddhahood. Obviously, that's Nam Yoho Renge Kyo and what we believe, right? Yeah. In the lifespan 16th chapter, Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni reveals the true effect or the Buddhahood that he attained numberless major world system, dust particle, kalpas ago. He does not, however, fully clarify the true cause, the practice that led to his enlightenment. Hence, he is called the teacher of true effect. In contrast, Nichiren taught that Nam Yoho Renge Kyo is the law implicit, in other words, hidden in the depth of uh, her party implicit in the lifespan chapter and is the cause of enlightenment for all people is the cause of enlightenment for all buddhas he is called the teacher of true cause and his buddhism the buddhism of true cause or the buddhism of sowing that implants the seeds of enlightenment in the lives of those who practice it and in, and the modern interpretation of that now is called the buddhism of the sun that's what we practice as practitioners following President Kata and the first three presidents, Soka Kakai, right? Who is the teacher of true effect? I just said it. Shakyamuni, okay? Uh, in Nichiren's teachings, again, in Nichiren's teachings, there is a distinction made. In Nichiren's teaching, Shakyamuni Buddha. In the lifespan, 16th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni reveals the uh, true effect and Bud the Buddhahood he attained numberless major world system, dust particle, kalpas ago, uh, Goyaku Jintingo. He alludes to the cause of, the, uh, of that enlightenment only with the words, originally I practiced the Bodhisattva way and does not clarify the teaching or law that he practiced to attain Buddhahood. Shakyamuni Buddha is called the teacher of true effect because he revealed his original enlightenment as a result already achieved as an effect and did not specify its cause. Nichiren defined the true cause that enabled Shakyamuni and all other Buddhas to attain enlightenment as the law of Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. He is therefore called the teacher of true cause. And I'll 
stop there. I don't know where this pulled out from. So that's it from the dictionary. But then if I go to the orally transmitted teachings, okay? I, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, one more. Where is it? Excuse me. T-R-U-E. True Buddha, true land, true cause. At any rate, I just lost it, so it's not important to say it. Let me go to the OTT. I was going to read to you from the uh, from the dictionary, the section that on the fact that we don't have a relationship with Shakyamuni Buddha from the teaching practice and proof. We've already read that Gosho four weeks ago or something like that. Okay, so going to the lifespan, 16th chapter of the orally transmitted teachings, point three. Okay, so it's pretty important. It's right up there. It's one of the first things he's talking about. Point three. Regarding the words, but good men, it has been immeasurable, boundless, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions of nayudas of kalpas since I, in fact, attained Buddhahood. Okay, what I just referred to, right, when I was talking about the Buddha of true cause and the Buddha of true effect, right? Right, so, the record of the orally transmitted teaching says that Aishona goes directly into this again. He doesn't quote Mielo or uh, 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 Dengyo or... Uh, 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 Tantai. He says, the record of the orally transmitted teaching says, I, in fact, is, explained that, is explaining that Shakyamuni, in fact, attained Buddhahood in the inconceivably, inconceivably remote past, even though this concept uh, originates with Tantai, by the way. All right. I, in fact, is explaining that Shakyamuni, in fact, attained Buddhahood in the inconceivably remote past, numberless major world system dust particle kalpas ago. The meaning of this chapter, however, is that I represents the living beings of the Dharma realm. It's all, I represents all living beings. I here refers to each and every being in the ten worlds. In fact, establishes that I is a Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies. So everybody is a Buddha, everything is a, a Buddha endowed with the three bodies. This is what is being called fact. Attained refers to both one who attains and to the thing attained. Attain means to open or reveal. It is to reveal that the beings of the Dharma realm are Buddhas eternally endowed with the three bodies. Buddhahood means being enlightened to this. Everybody's with me? You understand what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. In the word since, irai, the element I already or having passed refers to the past, and the element rai, coming, refers to the future. And the present is included in these two elements, I and rai, e and rai. The passage is thus saying that I, or the beings of the Dharma realm, in fact revealed the Buddhahood that is immeasurable and boundless in both past and future. Boundless would mean no beginning, no end. We're talking about now Kuan rather than numberless major world system, dust particle, kalpas that go, uh, Goyaku Jintingo. Do you understand? That's the big difference. Shakyamuni is Goyaku Jintingo. Nichiren is the Buddha of Kuan. Okay, the original state. That's what Nam Myoho Rengekyo is. That's why he teaches Nam Myoho Rengekyo. Where is the teaching of Nam Myoho Rengekyo? The entire teaching is contained in the phrase Nam Myoho Rengekyo. He says that's all there is to it. That's how powerful it is. That's how pure it is. Okay, he says uh, attained refers both to the one who attains and to the thing attained. Attained means to open or to reveal. Pardon me. I, I'm just okay. kidding. He says, the passage is just saying that I, or the beings of the Dharma realm, in fact revealed the Buddhahood that is immeasurable and boundless in both past and future. It is referring to the hundred worlds and thousand factors and the three thousand realms in a single moment of life. The two words hundred and thousand in the sutra passage refer to the hundred worlds and the thousand factors that are involved in the computation of each and in Sanzen, right? Three thousand realms in a single moment of life. That's where the hundred worlds and a thousand factors comes from. These then represent the reality of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Everybody's with me, right? Okay. Now, Nitran and his followers, those who chant Nam Yoho Rengekyo, are the original lords of teaching of the lifespan chapter. That means we're the original disciples of the original teacher. Because has the Lotus Sutra only been preached by Shakyamuni? 
No. If we read the Lotus Sutra, the Lotus Sutra has been preached by innumerable, innumerable Buddhas before Shakyamuni. His father, a great universal wisdom, excellence, preached the Lotus Sutra. Okay? So, again, now Nichiren and his followers are chant nam yoho renge kyo Because we chant the original teaching, we are the original lords of teaching. Okay? So even when he calls, says Shakyamuni, lord of teaching, that's like easy speak to not have to explain all this at the very beginning while well, he has just now gotten exiled to Sado Island is my point. He's just gotten through Tatsunokuchi. The full realization and the full expression of him being the original teacher has not occurred yet. Who, who derives the epiphany that he's the original teacher? It's understood by Nikko Shonin. But who's the first one to, to make it a declarative as part of the teaching? Huh? Nichikan! Who is the, our Gohonzon is, is, is Nichikan's inscribed Gohonzon. Nichikan. So all of you that are watching, go back to the video. This is Nichikan. And you'll get the whole lineage that I'm talking about here. All right, it's much deeper than just Nichiren and Shakyamuni. Okay, Shakyamuni never said or heard the words or heard the words Nam Yoho Rengeko. Neither did Tentai because he pronounced them in Mandarin, he didn't pronounce them in, Chi in, in Japanese. Okay, so let me continue. Now, Nichiren and his followers, us, were the original lords of teaching of the lifespan chapter. Mm -hmm. Okay, the lifespan chapter, the chapter that reveals numberless, you know, uh, kuan. Okay, generally speaking, the bodhisattvas of the theoretical teaching are not the sort of persons who are qualified to handle this chapter because they ha can't handle the obstacles that are, are a part of the process of revealing the true teaching in the latter day. Uh, for they employ an approach in which the theoretical teaching is on the surface and the essential teaching is in the background, while Nietzsche and his followers uh, an, uh, employ an approach in which the essential teaching, nam myoho rengekyo is in the forefront, and the theoretical teaching, the Berg Buddhism of the harvest, okay, not just, do you understand? He's talk, when he's talking about theoretical teaching, he's talking about the theoretical teaching of the Buddhism of, of, of the Lotus Sutra that's no longer valid because we're in the fifth 500-year period. Do you understand? In the fifth 500-year period, in the latter day of the law, even Lotus Sutra is provisional. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Okay, then that would, that, would, that would then suddenly mean that at this period, Shakyamuni is not all that in a bag of chips. He doesn't lead the way to Buddhahood. He leads to the teaching that leads to Buddhahood, but he doesn't lead to Buddhahood. Do you understand? Yes. It's not the time anymore when he can do that for you, okay? Right. Through what he tells you. Be that as it may, this chapter does not represent the teaching that is essential for the latter day of the law. That's the most significant sentence of everything I've read here. Okay, be that as it may, this chapter, what chapter is he talking about? Huh? The 16th chapter of the Lotus Sutra is what he's talking about, okay? Be that it is as it may, this chapter, the Lotus Sutra chapter 16, does not, does not represent the teaching that is essential for the latter day of the law. Do you understand? Because it's the Buddhism of the harvest. It can't. Nichiren is the only one that reveals the Buddhism of sowing. Shakyamuni didn't reveal the Buddhism of sowing. Tentai didn't reveal. Negerjun, nobody but Nichiren. That's why he keeps saying to slander me is a, is a, is a, a, a bad karma maker, a thing that you can't get rid of very easily. All right? This chapter does not represent the teaching that is essential for the latter day of the law. The reason is that this chapter embodies the Buddhism of the harvest suitable for the time when the Buddha was in the world. But only the five characters of the Daimoku constitute the Buddhism of sowing that is suitable 
for the time. Thus, the Buddhism of the harvest is for the time when the Buddha was in the world, and the Buddhism of sowing is for the time after his passing. Hence, it is the Buddhism of sowing that is needed in the latter day of the law. Okay, great. Now let me go to the background here once again from teaching practice and proof there is no longer a single person who has formed a relationship with Shakyamuni Buddha. Let me go to the pure and far-reaching voice background on page 333. This letter was written at Ichinasawa on Sato Island in 1272 and addressed to Shijo Saburo Seimanojo, commonly known as Shijo Kingo, a samurai and one of Nichiren Daishonin's followers who lived in Kamakura. It was prompted by the Daishonin's gratitude for offerings that Shijo Kingo had sent via messenger for his mother's third annual memorial service held on the second anniversary of her death. Soon after the Daishonin was exiled to Sato, Kingo sent a messenger to him with various offerings. Through this messenger, the Daishonin entrusted Kingo with his treatise, The Opening of the Eyes, which he had completed in the second month of 1272. A few months later, Kingo himself made the journey to Sato to visit the Daishonin. He again visited the Daishonin in the fifth month of 1273. In this letter, Nichiren Daishonin first discusses the power of one person, the ruler, to influence an entire nation. This is especially evident in, in the propagation of Buddhist teachings, where the ruler's support can ensure that Buddhism will prosper while its opposition will greatly hinder its spread. Citing histor historical examples, the Daishonin points out that the merits of the various Buddhist schools, which ought to, deter ought to be determined on the basis of their respective teachings, have all too, bit often, bit have all too often been judged according to the preference of those in power. His own tribulations, he adds, arise from the very fact that he has dared to criticize the doctrines in which both the ruler and his subjects believe. Nonetheless, the Daishonin declares, in light of the Lotus Sutra, he is the Buddha's envoy and has made his advent in Japan in accordance with the Buddha's mandate. Moreover, the Lotus Sutra, whose essence he is propagating, has been affirmed by all the Buddhas and encompasses all truths. Each word or phrase of the sutra contains the merit of all Buddhas and is therefore comparable to a wish-granting jewel that is said to possess the power to produce inexhaustible treasures. In the concluding section, from which the letter takes its name. The Daishonin states the significance of the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice. He designates this voice as far most among the Buddha's 32 distinguishing physical features because it expresses the Buddha's mind or intent. This pure and far-reaching voice has been preserved in the written words of the Lotus Sutra. Thus, the Sutra itself is the living body of Shakyamuni Buddha. In feudal times when Nichiren Daishonin lived, as well as the earlier as earlier in India and China, the ruler and his ministers wielded a power over their subjects that was virtually absolute. As this letter indicates, without the sovereign's consent, it was extremely difficult to propagate the Buddha's teach, Buddhist teachings, and monks were obliged to obtain the support of powerful patrons in order to protect the teachings. Now, however, in those countries where sovereignty rests with the people and freedom of religion is guaranteed, citizens carry out the mission to protect and propagate Buddhism, which is what we're doing. The Daishonin is ultimately emphasizing in this letter that the greatness of true Buddhism far surpasses such things as the authority of a ruler. Okay, that down. Uh, now I'm going to go straight to... I don't know where that came from. Stick it there just in case. We'll go to the Gosho itself, and I'm only going to read the sections that are in gray. And then next time we get together, I'm going to read the whole Gosho and then get into more of the collateral material that I wanted to support the point that I made at the front end of this, okay? I'm not disagreeing with President Ikeda. I'm clarifying what he's saying as it relates to my understanding of what he could possibly mean by what he's saying. Okay, so here we go, all right? The pure and far-reaching voice speak out with, the, with voices ringing with truth and justice. Okay, so what does that basically say? What's that basically telling you as a bodhisattva of the earth? Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. You must speak up. You must speak out, okay? You must do your job. And where's this pure and far-reaching voice? Who has it? 
Every single one of us, all of us, is referring to the pure and far-reaching voice of Shakyamuni Buddha preaching the law, but we all have this same pure and far-reaching voice. Our voice reaches far beyond where our physical body, our physical body realm uh, 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 exists. He says, the past, just like, like right now, I mean, right now, this conversation is going way beyond those of you that can physically hear my, because of sound waves, it's going across the internet so that it's all over the world right now, at this very moment. That's a very f pure and far-reaching voice, frankly. Okay, the passage for study in this lecture, such is the way, this just comes up from the Gosha from page 328. Mm -hmm. Such is the way of the world that a country's ru ruler exerts a powerful influence. And such too is the way of Buddhism. The Buddha long ago entrusted the protection of his teachings to the ruler. Therefore, even though wise men who are sages or worthies may appear, if they do not abide by the authority of the ruler, they will not be able to carry out the propagation of Buddhism. And even if it should later be propagated at the beginning, it will without fail meet with great obstacles. Continuing, uh, people hate me and, sleep, and ceaselessly plot to a plot in secret to do me injury. The Daishonin continues on page uh, 330. He says, I, he continues, I will leave aside the various persecutions that I suffered earlier and merely mention that last year on the 12th day of the ninth month, I incurred the wrath of the government authorities. And on the night of the same day was to have been beheaded He's talking about the Tatsunokuchi persecution, right? Yeah. However, so, somehow or other, so he doesn't qualify as a light, a big bright light appeared in the night. Mm -hmm. Somehow or other, he always goes back. This is how he describes it always. It's like, for some reason, they didn't. Okay, somehow or other, I lived to see the morning and came instead to this island province of Sado where I have been residing ever since. I have been abandoned by the world. Listen to the words that he's using as he's writing to Shijo Kingo now in, in the far and reaching voice, uh, the, the pure and far reaching voice. He goes, I lived to see the morning and came instead to this island province of Sado. Instead of getting killed, I got exiled where I have been residing ever since. I have been abandoned by the world abandoned by the law of the Buddha and the heavenly God show me no pity. I am the one, I am one who has been cast aside by both secular and Buddhist realms. Okay, and what does that tell you? He's in struggle still. Yes, yeah. and is he, is, he, is he thinking it's easy no. or is it simple? Or, or anything like that? No, this is basically saying sometimes when we feel, where is my protection? You know? So did Nietzsche at times. Because we can't see the future. Buddha wisdom doesn't mean we become clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. Okay? It just means that we perceive the truth. Yeah. We'll know when those things that protect us are occurring. Mm -hmm. Okay? We have faith that they're going to occur. All right? So, again, understand there is no difference. If he can talk like this, and you know you talk like this, I know all of you have had this kind of feeling before. You would have to have. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. You've all been practicing too long to not come to the point where you go, how <laughs> long do I have to? Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So, understand, this is all par for the course. It's all natural. It's all the reality of the Deshona's life. From the beginning of his teaching to the end of his teaching is a point of traverse of time and a growth of wisdom. He didn't know everything there was to know when he was 14 years old and saw the reflection of the Gohonzon in, in, in the pond at Seijoji. Okay? So he continues from page 330, 331. And yet in your sincerity, you have sent your messenger all the way here to me, off, uh, along with offerings for a third annual memorial service for your beloved mother, a matter of utmost importance in your life. The Lotus Sutra states, if one of these good men or good women in the time after I have passed into extinction is able to secretly expound the Lotus Sutra to one person, even one phrase of it, then you should know that he or she is the envoy of the thus come one. He has been dispatched by the thus come one and carries out the thus come one's work. 
one who recites even one word or phrase of the Lotus Sutra and who speaks about it to another person is the emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha, Lord of Teachings. Okay? And I, Nietzsche, and humble person though I am, have received Shakyamuni Buddha's royal command and come to this country of Japan. Thus, it is apparent from the sutra that anyone who speaks a single word of slander against me will be committing a crime that will condemn him to the hell of incessant suffering. And anyone who offers so much as a word or a phrase on my behalf will acquire greater blessings than if he had made offerings to countless Buddhas. That would signify he considers himself to have an important um, function in this entire process. Because he realizes my teaching is the one that was, 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 was prophesied by Shakyamuni in the Great Collection Sutra as the one that will appear as, appear as the great pure law in the fifth 500 year period, which is where he is right now at that point in time. Continuing on page 83, the benefit of the Lotus Sutra is such that even a single word of it embodies the threefold blessings of Shakyamuni many treasures and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. What's that then? Who's Shakyamuni many direct, uh, uh, treasures and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions? All the Buddhas that there are, frankly, at that point in time, okay? To illustrate it is like a wish-granting jewel. One such jewel is the same as a hundred such jewels. One wish-granting jewel can rain down countless treasures, and a hundred jewels can likewise produce inexhaustible treasures. Or it is like grinding up a hundred medicinal plants to make a pill, or to make a uh, or to make a hundred pills. Whether it be used for one pill or a hundred pill or a hundred, the medicine will have the power to cure sickness. Or again, it is like the uh, great sea. Each drop contains the flavors of all the multitude of streams that pour into the ocean, and the ocean itself contains the flavors of all the streams that flow into it. Or they say, and that's from 331, 332, and then con continuing on 332. Or they say if, that, if one uses the sinews of a lion to make strings for uh, uh, Kyoto and plucks them, then strings, will, uh, then strings made from the sinews of other animals will automatically snap, even though no one cuts them. The Buddhist preaching of the law is called the lion's roar, and the Lotus Sutra is the foremost roar of the lion. Mm -hmm. Continuing on page 332, 333. The foremost among the Buddha's 32 features is his pure and far-reaching voice. Lesser kings, great kings, and wheel-turning kings all possess this feature in some degree. Therefore, a single word from one of these kings can destroy the kingdom or ensure order in it. The edicts handed down by rulers represent a type of pure and far-reaching voice. 10,000 words spoken by 10,000 ordinary subjects cannot equal one word spoken by a king. The works known as the three records and the five canons represent the words of lesser kings. What brings order to this small kingdom of Japan, what enables the heavenly king Brahma to command the inhabitants of the threefold world, and what enables the Buddha to command Brahma, Chakra, and the other deities is none other than this pure and far-reaching voice. It is the voice of nam myoho rin the Buddha, The Buddha's utterances have become the works that compose the entire body of sutras and bring benefit to all living beings. And among the sutras, the Lotus Sutra is a manifestation in writing of the thus come one Shakyamuni's intent to make everyone equal to himself and you know now must reveal the truth and all the other things that's in that. It is his voice set down in written words. Thus the Buddha's heart is embodied in these written words. To illustrate, it's like the seeds that sprout, grow into plants and produce rice. Though the form of the rice changes, its essence remains the same. Continuing with the lecture. Speak out tirelessly with profound conviction. Voices filled with the power of the Buddha are certain to open the way. When I close my eyes, I hear the voice of my mentor, Second jo Ahsoka Gakkai President Jose Toda, as clearly as if he were still alive. 
It was a stern yet warm voice offering guidance and instruction to young people. It was a kind voice embracing members submerged in suffering. It was a bold voice declaring his resolve to accomplish Kosen Rufu. His voice still resounds in my ears, just as Mr. Osaki's and Mr. Matsuoka's do as well. In the past, I arranged to have Mr. Toda's lectures on Nitrin's writings made available to members in the form of phonograph records. I wanted to pass on his voice to future generations. The idea came to me in February 1951 when I was studying Hall Kane's novel, The Eternal City, with my mentor. Set in Rome in 1900, the novel contains a scene in which the hero, David Rossi, listens to a phonograph recording of the voice of the elderly revolutionary who was his mentor. The recording was the mentor's last will and testament from his place of exile, entrusting the future to his youthful disciple. Moved to tears, Rossi vows to carry on the struggle for justice. As I sat with the other members in front of Mr. Tota discussing the great ideal of Kosen Rufu, a wish to preserve his impassioned voice for posterity and allow as many members as possible to hear it formed in my heart. And then in 1959, on the first New Year's Day after Mr. Tota's passing, I listened to a tape recording of one of my mentor's lectures together with other members, members <clears throat> at the Soka Gakkai headquarters. As his voice rang out, Everyone sat upright, sat straight. As his voice rang out, everyone sat up straight, wept tears of emotion, and vowed to strive their hardest. A short time later, I, arrived, I arranged to have a series of phonograph records of both his lectures and speeches produced. I was solely motivated by the wish that his inspiring voice should never fade. The day on which the first record in this series, A Lecture on Prolonging Life, was completed, I wrote in my diary, very happy, repaying my debt of gratitude. Continuing, second column, page 85. The voice carries out the work of the Buddha. Nichiren Daishonin repeatedly stresses the importance, the importance of the power of the voice. The voice carries out the work of the Buddha from the orally transmitted teaching. Four, page four, unrelentingly proclaim the mystic law from the OTT, uh, from, uh, pardon me, uh, pardon me, the voice carries out the work of the Buddha from the OTT, page four, Un unrelentingly proclaim the mystic law from WND, page 394, and when a lion war roars, all the other beasts are silenced from WND, page 959. Kosen Rufu is a struggle of words. It was so in the Daishonin times, it is so today, and it will remain so in the eternal future. That's why our voices are important. They are our weapon, our ammunition. That's how we utilize our wisdom, is with our voices, right? That's how we pass it on. If we keep proclaiming the truth, uh, proclaiming the truth, that means we're using our voice, our words are certain to touch the hearts of those we talk to. If we continue to speak out for justice, we will be able to defeat wrongdoing and injustice. An earnest voice, an impassioned voice, will reach and move people's hearts. In this chapter, we will study the pure and far-reaching voice and look at how powerful our voices can be as a force for transforming the times. Continuing, page 86. Worthy rulers serve the people, going back to the Gosho. Such is the way of the world that the country's ruler exerts a powerful influence. And such, too, is the way of Buddhism. Thank you. The Buddha long ago entrusted the protection of his teachings to the ruler. Therefore, even though wise men who are sages or worthies may appear, if they do not abide by the authority of the ruler, they will not be able to carry out the propagation of Buddhism. And even if it should later be propagated at the beginning, it will without fail meet with great obstacles. Nichiren Daishonin sent this letter to Shijo Kingo in September 1272 while in exile on Sado Island. In it, he stresses that the persecutions he has undergone are for the sake of Buddhism, and he declares his intention to make even greater efforts to propagate the Lotus Sutra, the teaching of universal enlightenment, in accord with the mission he has undertaken based on the Buddha's decree. He also praises Shijo Kingo for his sincere support. 
In the opening, the Daishonin cites Duke Huan of Qi Yi of Qi and uh, King Chuang of Chu, two rulers from the spring and autumn period of Chinese history as examples of how the direction of an entire nation can be influenced by the actions of its ruler. He then goes on to state the widely held view of the time that a person is born as a country's ruler as a result of having observed the 10 good precepts in past existence and that rulers remain in power as long as their actions continue to find favor with, heavenly, with the heavenly deities. We can see this as Nietzsche's explanation of the qualities <clears throat> pardon me, and requirements of a ruler, of a ruler. It goes without saying that the task of government should be undertaken by people who are committed to working for the benefit of all. Those who wield power solely for their own self-interest and self-aggrandizement do not deserve to be called worthy rulers. So he's not talking about people that are in it for themselves. He's talking about people that are actually rulers, which means you're benevolent. You're living for the subject's well-being. King Ashoka of India, for example, was known as one of the greatest rulers of his day. <clears throat> um, who was King Ashoka's uh, uh, dad? King Ajashatru. What, what happened to King Ajashatru? He was killed by King Ashoka, his own son. Okay? All right. So now, here, now let's go back into King Ashoka and remember what a great guy he was, really. Okay? <laughs> King Ashoka of India, for example, was known as one of the greatest rulers of his day. Though he was a brutal warrior at the beginning of his reign and feared by all as a tyrant, he later transformed his rule based on Buddhism to one of peace and promoted the welfare of the people his name now forever engraved in history okay. but what did it take for that to happen huh no nope. huh now he was he was a disciple of devadat okay that was his problem okay what happened is that the the, the Shakyamuni's mercy, all right, effectively helped him cure unbelievable sores. He had had an outbreak of sores all over his body. He was in a state of suffering and misery that was worse than death, okay? That was really a reflection for the karma that he had made up to that point, okay? And when he was able to get rid of that malady of those sores that he had created for himself through the teaching of the Buddha. He then devoted himself to the people and creating stupas throughout the land of wherever, whatever, Magdagada, whatever the king of the kingdom's name was. And he went about for the rest of his life propagating the teachings of the Buddha. Y'all with me? Okay, so he says, I have discussed king... You're with me, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I have, bottom of page 86, second column, I have discussed King Ashoka in detail with Dr. N. Radhakrishnan, I bet he's Indian, a leader of the Gandhian scholar and, far, and former director of the Gandhi Smirti and Darshan Smirti, a Gandhi museum and memorial. And excuse my BSG friends, my pronunciation of Hindi is so poor. In New Delhi, he said this is to say about, uh, pardon me, he had this to say about the ancient monarch, Ajashatru, the great, or, or, or Ashoka. The greatness of Ashoka lies in his having been able to find in Buddhism a rational ethical doctrine of change, enlightenment, and enhancement of abilities. He transformed from who he had been to who he became. Okay? What we do, we did a kind of human revolution, right? Yeah. All right. So, having witnessed the horrible suffering inflicted by the people of war uh, on the people by war, King Ashoka transformed his rule from con conquest by military force to rule by dharma or the Buddhist law. That's why he put the stupas all over the place. They had the Buddhist teachings on them. That was the Buddhist law, right? In a society. <clears throat> where, the, where the ruler put into practice the spirit of Buddhism, 
a nation of peace and culture was created, a very rare occurrence in the course of history. Nietzsche describes the principle of how Buddhism will spread when so-called sages or worthies exist and the ruler understands the correct teaching of Buddhism. So it, is, uh, so it is inevitable, he says, that the practitioners of the correct teaching should encounter persecution when the rulers follow erroneous teachings that slander the Lotus Sutra. Does everybody understand what that's saying? I'll reread it. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. Listen to what I'm saying. Nietzsche, top of page 87, first column. Nietzsche describes the principle. Okay, now whose principle is it? It's Nietzsche's principle, qualified through his wisdom as the Buddha, perceiving and watching and, 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 and utilizing his wisdom as the Buddhism of sowing founder, right? He describes the principle of how Buddhism will spread when so-called sages or worthies exist and the ruler understands the correct teaching of Buddhism. Now, what is the correct teaching of Buddhism? It changes with the age. It's the latter day of the law. It's Nam Yoho Rengekyo right now. Was it Nam Yoho Rengekyo when, when uh, Ashoka was the king? No. no. No, it was the Buddhism of harvest. It was the teaching of Shakyamuni. That's what this is trying to, I'm, that's why I had you re, re I'm rereading it. I understand what it's saying. Buddhism describes the principle of how Buddhism will spread when so-called sages or worthies, all of us bodhisattvas of the earth, minimally qualify as that, guys. I don't care what you think of yourself, all right, <clears throat> exist and the ruler understands the correct teaching of Buddhism. So it is inevitable, he says, that the practitioners of the correct teaching should encounter persecution when the rulers follow erroneous teachings that slander the Lotus Sutra. So when, what, what's our job? To teach the teaching of the Lotus Sutra. When the ruler is teaching something that is opposing the Lotus Sutra, obviously we're going to be in opposition with the ruler automatically, right? Yes. Okay, that's why. So it is inevitable, he says, mm -hmm. that the practitioners of the correct teachings should encounter persecution. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When the rulers... When the rulers follow erroneous teachings that slander the Lotus Sutra. Okay. Okay, so now realizing, continuing in the middle of page 87, first column, realizing a humanistic society that exists for the people's welfare. What is that? Correct teaching. What is that? What is that? What is that? The attainment of Kosan Rufu by the Bodhisattvas of the earth. It's not just Nam Yoho Rengekyo. It's the disciples of the original teacher using the original teaching to utilize the propagation for propagation and plant the seed everywhere. Just as the original teacher has asked us to as his disciples. Do you understand? All right. So realizing a humanistic society a humanistic society, a society that's based on the teaching that mm. all people are Buddhas, mm. that exists for the people's welfare, for the happiness of people. Mm -hmm. A society that exists for the happiness of people. Does that exist anywhere right now? Mm. As a primary, I mean, it's, it's stated as the objective of, say, even China, but that is, it doesn't mean that all people are actually devoted to that process. We at Bodhisattvas of the Earth, that's what we do. Mm right? We try to realize a humanistic uh, society that exists for the people's we welfare. Continuing page 87, first column. In subsequent passages, Nietzsche describes how in India, China, and Japan, inferior teachings such as those of the Dharma Characteristics School, the True Word School, and the Flower Garland School spread throughout the land because they received the protection of the ruler. He also cites the examples of the venerable Arashima, Bodhisattva Aradeva, Chu Taoshin, and the uh, Tripitaka Master Batao being persecuted because they propagated the correct teaching. And you all know, guys all know those guys, right? 
Arashima branded on the face. Another one got a whole cart of dung thrown on him and uh, and on and on and on. <laughs> These guys, all propaganda. Whoa, that was not good. Time out, everybody. A little obstacle. <laughs> This is the most important thing. It's okay. Yeah, it will, but the, tape, the pages are all going to stick together. All right, so I need another one more. I can't get under there with there being this much water. I really didn't need that much water. Thank you. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, let's try to go back to where we were. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's good. You okay? No, because my feet are still sliding around. Go ahead. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's water underneath your chair, too. Yes. It's, it, it's, it, my shoes are wet, so it won't, they, they're not going to dry off just because you wiped the floor. I still know. Okay. Okay. I am not going to go there. Don't worry about it. No big deal. Okay. What? Okay. That doesn't mean I want to put my feet down because they're soaking wet. <laughs> okay, continuing. Okay. Page 87, first column, middle of the first column. Uh, in subsequent passages, Nietzsche describes how in India, China, and Japan, inferior teachings, uh, I just finished that. I'll, I'll go ahead and start from there. There we go. In subsequent passages, Nietzsche describes how in India, China, and Japan, inferior teachings such as those of the Dharma characteristic school, the true words school, the flower garland school, uh, spread throughout the land because they received the protection of the ruler. He also cites the example of the venerable Arashima, Bodhisattva Aradeva, Chu Tao Sheng, Tripitaka Master Fao Tsao, uh, being persecuted because they propagated the correct teaching. In the latter day of the law, an age afflicted with continuous strife, uh, the correct teaching had become obscured, and Nichiren demonstrated with the government and, and remonstrated with the government. His, uh, he submitted his treatise on establishing the correct teaching for the peace of the land to the supreme ruler, Hojo Tokiyori, articulating the way to enable all people to attain Buddhahood. He strove wholeheartedly without begrudging his life, convinced that the only way to save the people who were suffering from famine, epidemics, earthquakes, and other natural disasters was to eradicate the slander of the law that is spread throughout the land and to establish in people's hearts the correct teaching of Buddhism. Consistently refuting er erroneous teachings that cast the people in mi in to misery, this is the Daishonin spirit. Okay, I'm going to go back though and uh, reread this. In the latter day of the law, an age afflicted with continuous strife and conflict, the correct teaching, this is the bottom of page 87, first column. Mm. The correct teaching had become obscured and Nietzsche remonstrated with the government. He submitted his treatise uh, on establishing the correct teaching for the peace of the land of the uh, supreme ruler, Hojo Tokiyori, articulating the way to enable all people to attain Buddhahood, which was to chant nam myoho renge because it was now the fifth 500 year period, right? Mm. He strove, this is the important part, listen. Okay. He strove wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, mm. okay, that means that this was his most important desire. Yeah. Convinced that the only way to save the people, what was the, what's convinced mean? What is convinced? 
doubt-free faith. Mugi Washing again, convinced that the only way to save the people who were suffering from famine, epidemics, earthquakes, and other natural disasters was to eradicate the slander of the law that had spread throughout the land and to establish in people heart, people's hearts the correct teaching of Buddhism. So from that hyphenation, who were suffering from famine, earthquakes, uh, epidemics, I said, what does he say there? Very clearly. He strove wholeheartedly without begrudging his life, convinced that the only way to save the people was to eradicate the slander of the law that had spread throughout the land and to establish in people's hearts the correct teaching of Buddhism, was to refute all the existing schools of the day, mm -hmm. all of the Buddhism of harvest, all of the Buddhism of, of Shakyamuni, mm -hmm. and establish in people's hearts the Buddhism of sowing. Mm -hmm. That's what that is just saying, mm -hmm. okay? Not to spread Shakyamuni's teaching anymore to spread the teaching that's appropriate with this age, the latter day of the law, okay? Consistently refuting erroneous teachings that cast people into misery. This is the Daishonin spirit. In the present day, however, second column, page 87, is that in the present day, however, when sovereignty rests with the people, each individual is the ruler. Each individual is the ruler because you have the freedom to, to utilize your pure and far-reaching voice. Do you understand? That's what he's saying there. Okay. In the present day, however, the sovereignty rests with the people. Each individual is the ruler. The question then becomes what kind of society the people create for themselves? It is, is it a society that fails to value human life? A, a, a society uh, rife with discrimination? Or is it a society in which people work together to elevate their states of life? Is it a society that attacks defenseless, you know, other countries and starts wars? No, no. Okay. Um, continue on page 87. The belief held by the individuals who make up society are the decisive factors in how it is shaped. That's why we do Shakabuka, all right? That is why practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, through their personal inner transformation, we must resolutely fight, pardon me, that is why practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, through their personal inner transformation, continue to make efforts to realize a society that elevates the life condition of the people. So what is that saying? Once you become a Buddha. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what is it really? Okay, well, the point I'm trying to make, the beliefs held by individuals who, are, who make up society are the decisive factors in how it is shaped. If you believe you're a bodhisattva of the earth, then you must behave and function as a bodhisattva of the earth, okay? Mm -hmm. That is why practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, is he talking about people that read and talk the Lotus Sutra? No, when he says the practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, he's talking about people that chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo, right? Yes. That is why practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, that is why people that practice this Buddhism of, the, of sowing mm. through their personal inner transformation. So it's not through what they say, it's who they become that creates Kosen Rufu. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's the living example that they are, not the words that keep coming out of their mouth that are just words like everybody else. Right. Mm. Do you understand? Yes. There's a huge difference that he's saying here. He's very, very cleverly, very cleanly, yes. very briefly clicking it off. But that's mm -hmm. what he's saying. The beliefs held by the individuals who make up society are the decisive factors in how it is shaped. Mm -hmm. If that is why practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, their person, through their personal inner transformation, human revolution, mm -hmm. continue to make efforts to realize a society that elevates the life condition of the people. They continue to make efforts to achieve Kosen Rufu, widespread propagation for the pacification of the land to realize such a society, one that experiences Kosen Rufu, a humanistic society that exists for the sake of the people. And I'm adding a little bit, but that's making it clear. We must resolutely fight against the tendencies and ideas taking root in society that devalue life, totalitarianism and humanity, 
speaking out forcefully for what is right and just, when nationalism becomes an issue of my team versus your team and your life isn't worth what the same as my life, that is an incorrect understanding of life. Right. Okay? This is the fundamental tenant uh, underlying our daily efforts as SGI members to, pr to promote dialogue everywhere, in every country, wherever we are, with all our friends who are all different nationalities, who are all different races, who speak all different languages. Whew. It is also the essence of our noble struggle for Kosen Rufu, President Kate is saying. That's how it's going to happen. Directly aligned with the spirit of Nichiren Daishonin, because that's how we practice, of the same mind as Nichiren. Continuing on page 88. I'm just trying to keep these pages from sticking together, so sorry if I'm being fluffy here. I'm sorry. Uh, refusing to retreat in the face of persecution. People hate me. I like this part, guys. People hate me, too. Mm -hmm. People hate me and ceaselessly plot to secret, uh, in secret to do me injury. This is from the Go Show. Refusing to retreat in the face of persecution, page 88. People hate me and ceaselessly plot to, in secret to do me injury. I will leave aside the various persecutions that I suffered earlier and merely mention that last year on the 12th day of the ninth month, I incurred the wrath of the government authorities and on the night of the same day was to have been beheaded. Somehow or other, I lived to see the morning and came instead to this island province of Sada where I've been residing ever since. I've been abandoned by the world, abandoned by the law of the Buddha and the heavenly God show me no pity. I am one who has been cast aside by both secular and Buddhist realms. And yet, in your sincerity, you have sent, uh, sent me your messenger all the, way to, all the way here to me, along with offerings for the third annual memorial service of your beloved mother, a matter of utmost importance in your life. Continuing bottom of page 88, first column. People hate me and ceaselessly plot in secret to do me injury. In this section, Nitrin explains why he is the target of persecution and how it is related to a betrayal of Buddhism by the established schools. Great persecution was directed at him, he outlines, though, uh, because though he was not a part of the Buddhist establishment, he dared to refute the doctrines of two major teachers, Shan Tao, a patriarch of the Pure Land School in China, who was rever revered as a reincarnation of Amida Buddha, and Honen, the founder of the Pure Land School in Japan, who was regarded as a reincarnation of great Bodhisattva, of Bodhisattva great power. He writes, Last year on the 12th day of the ninth month, I incurred the wrath of the government authorities and goes on to chronicle his near execution at Tatsunakuchi in Kamakura the previous year on uh, September 12th, 1271, and his subsequent exile on Tusado. This Tatsunakuchi persecution was an attempt by members of the Kamakura military government to unjustly behead Nichiren, who had not committed any crime. It had been... It had been, pardon me. Who had not committed any crime. It had been instigated by envious and resentful religious authorities acting in collusion with government authorities. When this attempt failed, Nitrin was exiled to the island of Sado, a punishment that at the time was tantamount to a death sentence. His life on Sado was indescribably harsh and painful. Uh, the winters there were bitterly cold, and, and the Samido, the dwelling where Nichiren resided at Sukahara on Sado from November 1271 to the following spring, offered almost no protection from the elements. In one of his writings, he notes the boards of the roof did not meet and the walls were full of holes. The snow fell and piled up, never melting away, from WND 769. Uh, WNT1 769, first column, page 89. In addition, because of his status as an exile, many on Sado viewed him as an enemy and his life was in constant danger. In the pure and far-reaching voice, Nitrin describes the dire situation he faced on Sado. I have been abandoned by the world, abandoned by the law of the Buddha. Yet, whether the heavenly deities protected him or not, and no matter what other people thought, Nichiren lived on as the Buddha of the latter day of the law, never disheartened. 
He had stood up alone with a powerful determination to enable all people to attain enlightenment. This is borne out by his ringing statement. This I will state, let all the gods forsake me, let all persecutions assail me. Still, I will give my, uh, give my life for the sake of the law. From WND 280, I believe that's from the opening of the eyes. Uh, appreciation for a disciple's sincere dedication. Nietzsche expressed his sincere, pardon me real quick. Nietzsche expressed uh, his deep appreciation for the sincerity of Shijo Kingo, who sent a messenger to him as he was struggling amid these most trying of circumstances. At the end of this letter, he writes, Shakyamuni Buddha is already aware that you have sent offerings all the way here to the province of Sado. It was true, and it was in truth a most loyal and devoted thing for you to do. Shijo Kingo had dispatched a passenger from Kamakura to Sado with offerings for his mother's third annual memorial service held on the second anniversary of her death. Shijo Kingo was an exemplary disciple. At the Tatsunokuchi persecution, he had accompanied Nichiren on the execution grounds at the risk of his own life and wept at the prospect of his uh, uh, teacher's beheading. He had even committed that he would also be executed with Nichiren if Nichiren was going to be executed. And, and when the harassment of Nichiren's followers intensified in Kamakura afterward, Kingo continued to support and protect his teacher with unwavering loyalty and sincerity. This indeed must have made Nichiren very happy. Assisting and supporting our mentor, mm. to whom we owe a profound of, uh, debt of gratitude, striving to realize the mentor's aspirations and making the mentor proud, this is the essence of the noble path of disciples. Mm. The three founding uh, Soka Gakkai presidents also steadfastly found, followed the way of mentor and disciple in their struggle for Kosen Rufu, for Kosen Rufu, the realization of which was Nichiren's cherished wish. Mr. Toda supported Mr. Makaguchi with a wholehearted and selfless dedication. I did the same in supporting Mr. Toda. I have walked a path of disciple for more than a half a century, thinking only of what I could do for the sake of my mentor. This month, when we celebrate May 3rd, Soka Gakkai Day, a proud anniversary of mentor, mentor and disciple, I, ho I hope that my dependable young friends in the youth division will vibrantly carry on the spirit of Soka mentor and disciple. And let me just inject this again. I'm getting old. We're all getting older. President Kate is real old now. Okay. The future of the world depends on all you young people that might be listening to me, an old guy talking right now. I don't know if everybody listening to me is my age or if you're younger than me. I don't know how old any of you are. I started when I was 19. This is what he's talking about, man. This is what he's talking about. You guys are the ones that are going to bring home the bacon as it relates to the truth of this proof of mm -hmm. actual fact in the lives of the, of the practitioners you must be practitioners. You must walk the walk and you must talk the talk. And I encourage you to do so just as Daisaku Ikeda has said so here. Because without you, uh, I'm doing this for, really, for you. This is for my kids. They're, they're part of you. That's what I'm talking about. It's for the future. Page 90, <clears throat> top of the column. Appearing where we are in response to the, pardon me, appearing where we are in response to the Buddha's decree. Does everybody understand what that means? What does that mean to you? Appearing where we are in response to the Buddha's decree. What is the Buddha's decree? Kosen and Rufu. Which Buddha are we talking about then? Yeah, but by virtue of what Buddha do we become Buddhists? Right. When we talk about it being the Buddha's decree, it's the Buddha's decree. The Buddha's the Shakyamuni is make everybody equal to to myself. But widespread propagation of the correct teaching is is the Dashonin's deal. Okay. So appearing where we are in response to the Buddha's decree, because we're bodhisattvas of the earth, because we're disciples of the original teacher, we have made our advent wherever we were supposed to for the sake of Kosen Rufu. That's what that is just saying. Do you understand? It's not by chance that you're here. It's not by chance you know who you know. You're supposed to be here to wide, do widespread propagation, okay? 
All right, so the lotus suit, going back to the Gosha, are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's saying. You're here for a reason. You're not here by chance, okay? And it's not just because you volunteered to be here. You didn't know where you were going to be when you volunteered. You volunteered to be wherever you needed to be for the sake of the law. That's the decree that makes you appear. Understand that's what we're saying here. You're here because of Namya Horengeko, not because of you. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. All right. The Lotus Sutra states, if one of these good men or good women in the time after I have passed into extinction is able to secretly expound the Lotus Sutra to one person, even one phrase of it, then you should know that he or she is the envoy of the Thus Come One. He has been dispatched by the Thus Come One and carries out the Thus Come One's work. One who recites even one word or phrase of Lotus Sutra and who speaks about it to another person is an emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha, Lord of Teachings. And I, Nichiren, humble person though I am, have received Shakyamuni Buddha's royal command and come to this country of Japan. Thus it is apparent from the Sutra that anyone who speaks a word of slander against me will be committing a crime that will condemn him to the hell of incessant suffering. And anyone who offers so much as a word or a phrase on my behalf will acquire great blessings, more great, uh, will acquire greater blessings than if they had made offerings to countless Buddhas. Page 90, bottom of the, bottom of the page. First column. In this section, Nichiren discusses the significance of the Buddha's emissaries who propagate the mystic law. Who are the Buddha's emissaries who propagate the mystic law? Us, the Bodhisattvas of the earth, okay? So he's talking about the significance of us. In this section, Nichiren discusses us, the sutra passage he quotes here comes from the teacher of the law. Are you guys teachers of the law? Every one of you is a teacher yeah. of the law. Mm -hmm. Okay, the sutra passage he quotes here comes to the teacher of the law, the 10th chapter, states that one who teaches even a single phrase of the sutra to another is an envoy of the thus come one. An envoy of the Buddha. Which Buddha? Nichiren, mm -hmm. the original teacher. It stresses that such a person is dispatched by the thus come one and carries out the thus come one's work. Are you following me though? Okay. You understand the distinction I'm making? When I'm talking about the Buddha, when I'm talking about the thus come, when I'm talking about the thus come work, one's work, I'm talking about Nichiren, I'm talking about Namya Horengeko, and I'm talking about Kosen Rufu. Mm -hmm. Okay? To be dispatched by the thus come one means to be sent by the Buddha. The Buddha, the enlightened one, doesn't mean Shakyamuni when he says the Buddha. Do you understand? He's talking about you when he says the Buddha. Frankly, if you can wrap your head about around it, that's exactly, there's no distinction between you and that Buddha mm -hmm. that he's referring to here. Mm -hmm. To be dispatched by the thus come one means to be sent by the Buddha to teach and convert others. In other words, such a person is a disciple of the Buddha. There's no separation between him and the Buddha, them and the Buddha. The thus come one's work, meanwhile, refers to propagating the mystic law to enable all people to attain enlightenment, which means the Buddha's great vow. Based on this passage, Nichiren affirms that one who recites even one word or phrase of the Lotus Sutra and who speaks about it to another person is the emissary of, the, of Shakyamuni Buddha. He adds that anyone who makes an offering of even a word or phrase of the sutra, that is, one who recites and spreads it, will acquire great blessings. Mystically true to these words, we, the comrades of Soka, have upheld and, propagate, and propagated the mystic law in the latter day. Now, mystically true to these words, what I just read here, based on this passage, Nietzsche uh, affirms that one who recites even one word of the, or phrase the Lotus Sutra and who speaks about it to another person is the, an emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha. He's not talking about the Shakyamuni Buddha of India or the Shakyamuni Buddha of the theoretical teaching. He's talking about the Shakyamuni Buddha of the essential teaching, which is code for the original teacher, which would not be somebody who had not revealed the original teaching. It isn't Shakyamuni. Do you understand? It's the Buddha. The Buddha is all living beings in their original state. 
Based on this, this passage, Nietzsche affirms that one who recites even one word or phrase of the Lotus Sutra and who speaks about it to another person is the emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha. This is all in quotation marks because that's how Nietzsche had to say it to uh, Shijo Kingo for him to not be going like this over his head. He adds that anyone who makes an offering of even a word or a phrase of the sutra, that is, who recites and spreads it, will acquire great blessings. But is he talking about saying uh, Jiga Tokuburai? No, he's talking about saying Myoho Rengekyo. He's talking about saying specifically Nam Myoho Rengekyo. Nam Myoho Rengekyo isn't in the Lotus Sutra. Mm. It only makes, it only comes forth from Nichiren. Right. All right. So he's saying, mystically true to these words, even though this was talking about Shakyamuni and is talking about Nichiren at a time before his teaching has even been completely qualified, let alone propagated broadly. Even though that's the case, mystically true to these words, we, thanks to President Makaguchi, President Toda, and then ultimately President Ikeda, and the formation of the Zoko Gagai, mystically true to this, this prophecy in the Lotus Sutra, we've come forth upholding Nam Myoho Rengekyo. You get it? The comrades that have upheld and propagated the mystic law in the latter day. What is the mystic law in the latter day? Nam Myoho Rengekyo. We haven't upheld the Lotus Sutra so much as we have the essence of the Lotus Sutra which is what's appropriate for the latter day. Only to the extent that we talk with others about our Buddhist practice and philosophy will the number of people who have formed a connection, when only as long as we're planting seeds ourselves, will people form a connection in Nietzsche and Buddhism increase and correctly sp and correct and correct and the correct teaching spread. Our voices are powerful. Words are our weapons in a positive sense. As long as we pray with passion and courage to help others find Nietzsche and Buddhism and to walk the path of happiness together with us, our words will resonate with them. This is because our voices infused with Nam Myoho Rengekyo, when we're speaking as Buddhists, mm -hmm. uh, have the power to awaken the Buddha nature of those to whom we speak. Mm -hmm. That could not be the case were we not Buddhists. Mm -hmm. All right. Even though the effect might not be immediately apparent, please be assured that your voice will deeply permeate their lives. Each SGI member is a noble emissary of shock of quote in quotations here is an emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha, Lord of Teachings. Each SGI member is a noble emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha, Lord of Teachings. But as I just read to you, when we started from the original, from the record of the orally transmitted teachings, we are the original teachers of the lifespan chapter of the Lotus Sutra, okay? Mm -hmm. So even though we might be an emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha, we are not a disciple of Shakyamuni Buddha. No. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. We're carrying on what he was alluding to during his time on earth, teaching what he did for the former in the middle day. Right. Understand? Mm -hmm. We are not inferior to Shakya, Shakyamuni. Mm -hmm. We're bodhisattvas of the earth. We're not inferior to any Buddha. We are all Buddhists. All right? Each SGI member is a noble emissary of Shakyamuni Buddha, Lord of the teachings. Lord of the teachings. For this very reason, I would like leaders to always make the welfare and happiness of the members their first priority. The Lotus Sutra states, if you see a person who accepts and upholds this sutra, you should rise and greet him from afar, showing him the same respect you would a Buddha because you're all Buddhas. We must accord all our fellow members who are striving earnestly for Kosen Rufu the same respect we would show a Buddha. Why? Because they are Buddhas. As leaders, please seek out those not to be nice or to be polite. It's because that's the respect they're due for who they actually are. As leaders, please seek out those working hard behind the scenes. 
and personally express your thanks to them. Sincerely praise their efforts. Do whatever you can for them. This is the golden rule of leadership in our movement. In this section, Nietzsche also says of himself, I, Nietzsche, humble person though I am, have received Shakyamuni Buddha's royal command and come to this country of Japan. From the perspective of Buddhism, we have chosen to play an active role in Kosen Rufu, where we are now with a precious mission as the Buddha's disciples. I hope all of you will take Nietzsche's words, come to this country, deeply to heart we've come here we came here we made the decision to be here we have all appeared in the country where we live because of our own wish our own vow for kosarufu and i came to this country because i fell in love with it the minute i stepped off the plane and all i asked about was how could i live there could never be how long have i been here more than 20 years wow <laughs> With that timeless vow in our hearts, let's dedicate our lives to the noble mission of shouldering the movement for Kosen Rufu in our respective communities. The immeasurable benefit contained in a single word of the Lotus Sutra, page 91. The benefit of the Lotus Sutra is such that even a single word of it embodies the threefold blessings of Shakyamuni, many treasures, and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. To illustrate, it is like a wish-granting jewel. One such jewel is the same as a hundred such jewels. One wish-granting jewel can rain down countless treasures, and a hundred jewels can likewise produce inexhaustible treasures. Or it is like the grinding up a hundred medicinal plants to make a pill, or to make a hundred pills. Whether it is used for one pill or a hundred, the medicine will have the power to cure sickness, or again, it is like the great sea. Each drop contains the flavors of all of the multitudes of streams that pour into the ocean, and the ocean itself contains the flavors of all the streams that flow into it. Page 331 and 332 from WND1. This is it. Okay. Or they uh, continue in page 92. Or they say that it, it is if one uses the sinews of a lion to make strings for Kyoto and plucks them, uh, then strings made from sinews of other animals will automatically snap even though no one cuts them. The Buddhist preaching of the law is called the lion's roar, and the Lotus Sutra is the foremost roar of the lion. Next, Nichiren goes on to say that while all the Buddhist teachings are true, the Lotus Sutra is the Buddha's ultimate teaching, and he further illuminates the benefit to be accrued by propagating it. Mm -hmm. In the section immediately before the above passage, he writes, the Lotus Sutra says, honestly discarding expedient means I will preach only the unsurpassed way. It also says, the world-honored one has long expounded his doctrines and now must reveal the truth. In view of these pronounce pronouncements, who could doubt that the Lotus Sutra represents the ultimate truth? And to this was added the testimony of the thus come one many treasures, the Buddhas of the ten directions extending their tongues to the Brahma heaven as further proof. WND page 331. Based on this, Nietzsche and also, I think that's probably the opening of the eyes, I'm not sure. Based on this, Nietzsche and then, uh, pardon me, not the, uh, uh, the object of devotion. Based on this, Nietzsche and then states, the benefit of the Lotus Sutra is such that even a single word of it embodies the threefold blessings of Shakyamuni, many treasures, and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions, all Buddhas of the uh, of the Ten Directions. Mm -mm. This is because Shakyamuni, many treasures of the Buddhas of the Ten Directions all attained their enlightenment through the practice, through practicing the correct teaching of the Lotus Sutra and the mystic law of Namyoho Renge Nam Renge leads all people to enlightenment. I'll say it again. This is because Shakyamuni, many treasures and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions all attained their enlightenment through practicing the correct teaching of the Lotus Sutra, which is Namyoho Rengekyo and the mystic law of Namyoho Rengekyo. They all practice Namyoho Rengekyo. And that's what leads them to all Buddhas to enlightenment. Nietzsche likens the boundless and immeasurable beneficial power of the mystic law of Namyoho Rengekyo to a wish granting jewel, a precious jewel that has the power to manifest anything one desires. 
One such jewel is the same as a hundred such jewels, he writes. One wish granting jewel can rain down countless treasures, and a hundred jewels can likewise produce inexhaustible treasures. To underscore the great benefit of the mystic law, the great benefit of Nam Yoho Rengekyo, he also offers the metaphors of how even just one pill made of extracts from a hundred medicinal plants can have the power to cure illness, and how one drop of water from the ocean contains water from all the multitudes of streams that flow in to the ocean. Mr. Toda once, in other words, that's the inseparability of all things is what he's qualifying there. Mr. Toda once gave some unforgettable guidance on the wish granting jewel. And, and Mickey in Sweden, my bro, you got, here you go. What is the wish granting jewel? This, this, this cluster of blessings that has come to us on, on side. Mm. Mr. Toda once gave some unforgettable guidance on the wish granting jewel at the general meeting of Tokyo uh, Suginami chapter in July 1955. First, he gave a down to earth explanation. The wish granting jewel is a gem that produces whatever treasures one heart, one's heart's desires. If you want a house, it will produce a house. If you want money, it will produce money. This jewel that will give you whatever your heart desires and in fact is in fact the cluster of unsurplat <laughs> pardon me. this jewel that will give you your heart's pardon me. this jewel that will give what your heart desires is in fact the cluster of unsurpassed jewels that has come to us unsought which is described as the lotus suit which is described in the lotus sutra there you go mickey okay it's nam yoho rengekyo Mm -hmm. What is needed for Kosen Rufu will definitely be realized when necessary. And when on, he went on confidently. This is still President Toda talking. Does that mean that, pardon me, does that mean then that whatever we seek, the Gohonzon will provide? Let me just, uh, dis <laughs> I love this. This is President Toda. This is when he talked all the time. Mm -hmm. This is, was his pure and far reaching voice. And then President Toda went on confidently. Does that mean then that whatever we seek, the Gohonzon will provide? Let me declare unmistakably, there is no wish that will fail to come true. There is no wish that will not be fulfilled. That was my mentor's impassioned declaration, President Kata says. Let's advance with that conviction of President Toda, held firmly in our hearts, that nothing that we pray for will fail to be achieved. As long as we have unwavering faith in the mystic law, chant fervently. You know what that means? That's intently, that's with focus, that's with faith, that's with purpose, that's with resolve. Mm -hmm. That's with not screwing around. That's not putting in the daimoker. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not chanting because you know you got to chant today. You're seeking Kosen Rufu with your life mm -hmm. and practice, chant fervently and practice courageously. We will never be deadlocked. We'll never fail to, 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 to reflect the power of the Buddha in our life. This is because if we have faith, the wish-granting jewel of the Gohonzon will shine in our hearts. Mm -hmm. That's how we show the proof of actual fact. The power of the lion's roar, it comes from that power, the proof of actual fact. Mm -hmm. Emphasizing the greatness of the mystic law, Nichiren goes on, also goes on. They say that if one uses the sinews of a lion to make strings for a koto and plucks them, then strings made from the sinews of other animals, animals will automatically snap. In other words, the sound of harp strings made of lion sinews prevails over that of all other strings. In the same way, among all the Buddha's lifetime's teachings, the Lotus Sutra is the foremost lion's roar. It is a declaration of the correct teaching and supreme truth, surpassing all other teachings. In the record of the orally transmitted teachings, the, uh, Nichiren states in regard to the term lion's roar, Japan Shishiku, and, and, the, and, and, and this is Mr. Koshikawa's favorite passage from the orally transmitted teachings. The first she of the word shishi or lion, which means teacher, is the wonderful law that is passed on by the teacher. The second she, which means of shishi, which means child, is the wonderful law that is received by the disciples. The roar is the sound of the teacher and the disciples chanting in unison. 
If the teacher and disciple chant Nam Yaho Rengekyo with one heart, as lion kings, they can overcome all diversity and karmic hindrances and attain happiness and victory in life. My brother David, for our conversation tomorrow, if teacher and disciple chant Nam Yaho Rengekyo with one heart, as lion kings, as lion kings, bro, they can overcome all adversity and karmic hindrance. All adversity and karmic hindrance and attain happiness and victory in life. You're promised. Page 93, the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice. I guess this is wrapping it up. The foremost among the Buddha's 32 features is his pure and far-reaching voice. Lesser kings, great kings, and wheel turning kings all possess this feature, this feature in some degree. Therefore, a single word from one of these kings can destroy the, uh, the kingdom or ensure order in it. The edicts handed down by rulers represent a type of pure and far-reaching voice. 10,000 words spoken by 10,000 ordinary subjects cannot equal... Uh, one word spoken by a king. The works known as the three records in the five canons represent the words of lesser kings. What brings order to this small kingdom of Japan? What enables the heavenly king Brahma to, uh, Brahme to command the inhabitants of the threefold world? And what enables the Buddha to command Brahme, Chakra, and the other deities is none other than his this pure and far-reaching voice, nam myoho the Buddha's utterances have become the works that compose the entire body of sutras and bring benefit to all living beings. And among the sutras, the Lotus Sutra is a manifestation in writing of the Thus Kawan Shakyamuni's intent. It is his voice set down in written words. Thus, the Buddha's heart is embodied in these written words. To illustrate it is like seeds that sprout, grow into plants, and produce rice. Though the form of rice changes, its essence remains the same. Next, Nichiren teaches, uh, touches on the 32 features of the Buddha and then discusses the foremost of these features, namely the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice, also known as the Brahme voice. The Buddhist scriptures describe the Buddha as possessing 32 special features, such as golden skin, a tuft of white hair between his eyebrows from which he sometimes emits a beam of light, and so forth. The Buddha is also often re referred to as possessing these 32 features and 80 characteristics, the 80 characteristics being another set of remarkable qualities. It is said that the reason the Buddha manifests these 32 features is to inspire people seeking spirit and to pave the way for teaching and converting them. In other words, on a more fundamental level, the 32 features are an expression of the life condition of the Buddha, symbolizing the special inner qualities of his character. With regard to these characteristics of the Buddha, Nichiren writes, if you chant nam myoho renge with your whole heart, you will naturally become endowed with the Buddha's 32 features and 80 characteristics. You will naturally be endowed with the same power and influence of Shakyamuni, many treasures, or anyone else they've been talking about. This does not mean, of course, that we become shining supernatural Buddhas. There is no such thing. Mm. Rather, through our faith and practice of the mystic law of chanting nam myoho renge we acquire the radiance of the Buddha's wisdom and character, as well as the same benefit of the Buddha. We make the causes that manifest as karmic reality in our lives, right? In discussing the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice, Nichiren first deems it the foremost of his 32 features. He then goes on to say that even rulers possess this feature in some degree, which is why a single word, with a single word they can benefit the people and decide the fate of their realms. How much more powerful then is the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice, he implies. He also states that the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice has taken the form of all Buddhist scriptures to guide all people to enlightenment. And the words of the Lotus Sutra in particular record the Buddha's true intent. The treatise on the great perfection of wisdom, which is Nagarjuna, describes the special characteristics of the Buddha's pure and far-reaching uh, voice as follows. One, deep as thunder. Two, clear and penetrating, bringing, bringing joy to all who hear it. Three, reaching the heart and arousing a feeling of reverence. Four, lucid and easy to understand. Five, a delight to listen to. In other words, the Buddha's pure and far-reaching voice is inspiring 
and reassuring, imparting courage and hope. No different than ours when we're being the Buddha in our present form, encouraging others to chant Nam Myoho Rengeko and transform themselves. In the case of the ruler, it is a powerful, reasonable voice, responsible voice that motivates people and leads a society. Uh, middle of page 95, a first column, a voice of truth that encourages people. He makes another point about this pure and far-reaching voice in another work. He writes, the Buddha possesses 32 features, 32, uh, 32 of them from the lowest, the markings of a thousand spoked wheel on the sole of each foot up to the unseen crown on his head belong in the category of visible and uh, non-coexistive physical attributes. Only the pure and far-reaching voice, he says, is not visible to the eye. It is an expression of the Buddha's mind. In this, we cannot help seeing the profound significance in Nichiren designating the pure and far-reaching voice, not one of the other remarkable physical traits as the foremost of the Buddha's distinguishing features. To free all people from suffering and to help them attain enlightenment is the Buddha's wish. It is the voice that manifests that wish in the world and actually motivates people. Continue speaking, to continue speaking out, to continue uttering words, to continue engaging in dialogue, to continue crying a lion's roar of justice to inspire people to attain enlightenment. Such tireless struggle of using the voice demonstrate the true power of the Buddha. Mm. Our Buddhist practice also consists of using our voice as emissaries of the Buddha. Chanting Nam, so we can't think of ourselves as just little members. We've got to see ourselves as an equal to President Ikeda, with a mission equal to President Ikeda, or else we're not going to be able to teach like President Ikeda. And there's going to come a time when that's exactly what we'll need to be able to do. All right. Chanting Nam Myoho Rengekyo is also the act of praising the Gohonzon. Hearing that voice, the protective forces of the universe are activated and roused to protect the person who is chanting. A weak, unclear voice will not activate them. I've said that before. I'll say it again. A weak, unclear voice will not activate them. So you can chant Daimoku and not activate them the protective influences mm. of chanting Daimoku, if you are not aspiring to do so. I mean, this is a weak, unclear voice is a sign of a lack of faith. Right. And if you go chant Daimoku without faith, eventually faith will come. But that won't be the Daimoku that's going to get you over the hump. That'll get you to first base. A weak, unclear voice. You have to be resonant in your Daimoku. You have to chant like you're the Buddha to pull off the power of the Buddha, all right? We must chant with strength and with a resonant voice, he continues. Of course, there are times when we fall ill and are unable to chant aloud in front of the Gohonzon. In such cases, we can chant in our hearts, it's fine. It is important that we chant earnestly because it's what's in our heart that's what's being expressed for the happiness of our friends, for victory in Kosen Rufu, and for our own human revolution. The inner voice of our fervent prayers will activate the positive forces and rouse our friends to move in the direction of hope, revitalization, and fresh development. The quality of our voice is important. I hope you will cultivate, uh, cultivate voices that are refreshing, warm, and sincere, voices that appeal to and energize others. Leaders' voices in particular need to be warm and gentle, assured, determined, and brimming with life force that they offer when they offer guidance and encouragement. Always acting with sincerity and integrity will allow you to become a bigger person. What's that talking about? always acting with sincerity and integrity. That means when you go give guidance or somebody is confiding with you what they're going through, you don't want to tell anybody else. You don't go, God, man, I was talking to. You don't ever share that. Sincerity and integrity, that means you keep secrets that are confided to you as secrets, secret, mm. all right, period. Always acting with sincerity and because no one will trust you as the Buddha if you don't behave such a way. Mm -hmm. Okay? Always acting with sincerity and integrity will allow you to become a bigger person. Mm -hmm. It'll become, you'll, you'll fill the shoes of the teacher instead of the disciple. It will allow you to strengthen and deepen your faith. 
encouraging others in trying circumstances, an act that brings great benefit. It's the transition from being a disciple to being a teacher. A confident voice reassures people. It is no exaggeration to say that the voice makes the leader. And what makes the confident voice of the leader? Arrogance? The proof of actual fact based on faith. Leaders know because they've already done everything that he's writing about and talking about. This isn't theoretical to them. This is also how they live their lives. Okay? But as the disciples of the president, they'll let him do the talking. But this is not only a Daisaku Akeda experiences deal. We all experience everything I'm speaking of here. We're all exactly the same as Daisaku Ikeda. We're all exactly the same as Nichiren Daishonen. All right? The confident voices of youth, and this is again to all you guys that are younger than me. When we speak with all our hearts, and being Mr. Toda said, our words will not fail to leave an impact. And the confident voices of youth have a, re have a resonance that can serve as the driving force for powerful new change. Because we are using our voices to help others become happy, it's important for us to make continuous and persistent efforts to engage in conversation. Mr. Toda said, if you speak to others a hundred times, it will return to you as a benefit a hundredfold. This is the meaning of the words, the voice carries out the work of the Buddha. The voice works on behalf of the Buddha. Let us use our voices to chant nam myoho renge brimming with powerful life force to impart courage and hope to our friends and to speak out with voices ringing with truth and justice in order, or make, in order to make the world a better place. The time is here. Burning with the great vow for Kosen Rufu and the ideal of establishing the correct teaching for the peace of the land, let's actively go out and talk with others toward building a peaceful world and helping as many people as possible find genuine, lasting happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.